Hi, I'm Mike Henry. And this is my Procreate 5 demo for the piece I call A Life of Transparency. So this is my take on an invisible character for my monster series, but something that I thought would be fun to kind of talk about is how I get to the final design. Not really in a sense where you're going to watch me design, but some of the thought process that I go through in order to come up with the original idea anyways. And then we'll just do a regular walkthrough. So let's uh, try something new where I write a bunch of stuff and try to visualize a little bit my thought process and we'll go from there. character series like this is actually kind of interesting because it's both explorative, but then it also has a framing device, which is the reinterpretation of some sort of a monster character. Now, some of these have been like just like a straight reach into the history books and grab like a universal monster. Others have been a little bit more of like a let's try something new or let's piece together some things. I kind of wanted to talk about since this character is the, like an invisible woman, which is obviously based off of like the invisible man. I wanted to talk a little bit about my thought process. So this is what goes on in my head. I don't usually write this out, but it's like, okay, Frankenstein, Wolfman, the creature, Invisible Man. Okay, cool. Let's go with Invisible Man. So that's step one is like, do I have something that already exists out there that I can start messing around with and start coming up with something new? I actually had thought of the Invisible Man a long time ago, but I just couldn't really come up with anything that I thought was of value. Uh, like just doing a cool interpretation of Invisible Man, I feel like that there are other people out there who've done that and done a really good job, and I'm not going to be that person. So just for a quick visual reference, here's what he looks like. Now it was, he kind of changes throughout like the original film, and like he gets worse over time and all that but for this let's just go with the classic like wrapped in bandages has the glasses on has like this uh i think it's like a robe uh, like a i don't know like a drinking jacket i don't know glasses and that's that's him right so we know that there's that classic thing because of the time it was really good to represent him that way he's invisible so how do you make him visible you wrap him in some stuff so what do we have here that we can take from it invisible yes uh, man, yes. Uh, what other things can we play with here? He's wrapped, that's what I was just talking about, where we wrap him so that we can see the character. In the original movie, he goes crazy. Uh, he becomes bad. He's gonna, like, you know, attack the world or whatever, and uh, with all of his invisible peoples. And then the movie was done in the 30s, so let's just say that it comes from the 30s. I actually honestly don't remember if it was contemporary at the time or not. I didn't do that much research because I was thinking much more like visual only, not really going that deep into it. So we've got this kind of like list of things that we can play with here. So it's like, okay, what do we keep that makes him uh make him accurate to like it's the invisible man well let's take the era and work with that we're going to keep the fact that he's invisible we're going to keep the fact that he's wrapped we're going to lose the crazy and the bad because i want this character to be a good guy and man is irrelevant to me and at the time i was trying to keep the cast more female oriented and i thought okay let's just make sure that like we, we use this one to do female so it's like what more can be done well we know we're going to keep in the invisible part, we're going to try it out as a woman, and we're going to keep the retro. We're not necessarily going to tie it directly to 30s, but we'll just keep it feeling like that far back retro, somewhere in that realm. So what are we going to do? Why don't we also take that retro thing and go with the adventurer route? So I'm trying to think, what can I do with this character that's like action packed? Can I make this person an adventurer? Can I make this person this? Can I make this person that? But adventure is what I settled on because I thought that it really kind of matched that look and feel pretty well, the look and feel of the era. Then we're going to make sure that we're still wrapping the character, although wrapped really isn't what's important. It's that they are made visible, like with the glasses, like we have in the original one. So with the adventure, I'm thinking, okay, what about something like Journey to the center of the earth or indiana jones which i'll write here in a second once this thing catches up to me um or something like around the world in 80 days or really anything etc there's lots of different things that you can do that you can pull reference from that's in the same vein so now we need to take stock of our descriptors of this character 
what is this character now that we've done some like choosing? Well, we know that she's a female adventurer. We know she's a world traveler. She's a millionaire. She's an entrepreneur. Well, we don't know these things, but these are sort of the words that we're starting to derive from the previous lists. She's a pilot, maybe. Maybe she's like a tomb raider, not like Lara Croft, like someone who just raids tombs. Uh, she has a transatlantic accent because we're trying to hit like some sort of an era thing. Um, who also happens to be invisible. So now instead of having a character who's entirely defined by the fact that they are invisible, we have a character that has a sort of rich character, potentially, we still have more work to do, but a rich character who happens to be invisible. Just adding another layer to what is this character and why are we paying attention to her in the first place. But I thought all of these characters were supposed to be synth wavy. Well that's why I added green. Just kidding. Since she exists amongst all of these other more modern synth wavy characters, I thought, what can we do about that? Why is she kind of out of time? So I thought, what if instead of her invisibility wasn't just the fact that she was see-through, but she was still kind of physically there, what if she was actually kind of frozen? Like she was removed from existence, but there was still something lingering behind, and that's what was the character that everybody perceived. So this scientific experiment that sort of pulled her out put her in permanent stasis. She's removed somewhere somehow, but she's still operating in our world, forever retro and ageless. Kind of immortal at that point. So now she's like this adventuring immortal person. So let's double this, uh, let's, let's take this again and build on it. So she's invisible, which makes her immortal because of the way that we're defining her invisibility. So she's ageless, which is maybe a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing. That is kind of up to the way a character might interpret that or a person, which gives us character something to actually work with there. So now let's actually just write a brief description about this character and see if we can come up with something that's kind of interesting. Maxine Drysdale was your ordinary average millionaire adventurer, woman of the world, until an accident, which we'll flesh out later, made her invisible. Rather than let this set her back, she used this as an advantage to increase her fame, fortune, becoming a mythical hero, and the source material for a lucrative media property owned by her. Taking the name, we have developed an era by really trying to house that in a certain time. Then, Millionaire Adventurer. Does this tell us about her capabilities, her past, her backstory? How did she become that? What can she do since she's a millionaire? Does she have access to things that a normal character wouldn't? Then I put the little thing about fleshing out later with the accident. That's a side story now that we can work with and we can always build off of that and expand it and have other characters who know it reference it. The fact that she's invisible, now instead of it being a twist on an invisible person, we are now putting the invisible as a twist on an adventurer. She's like a Scrooge McDuck type. Then we've got, rather than let this set her back, that builds character, that tells us a little bit about her. Uh, the twist is that she used all of this to actually gain fame and fortune more fame and fortune. And then at the end there, the part where she controls all of this, it kind of makes her like Iron Man actually, how Tony Stark was just really open about who he was and how he built off of that. We got through all of that process, which is a little bit clumsy, but now we've sort of stumbled into a place where we've got this idea. It's like basically draw an adventurer and then leave the adventurer out. So I started by referencing a lot of clothing from specific eras and trying to piece together this thing that kind of feels like a stereotypical adventure, but then incorporates new things that you wouldn't normally see. In this case, the new things that you wouldn't normally see would be like the neon green bandana, the neon green glowy goggles, the fact that she is invisible, and, and then the rest of it just trying to like hit the era. So the idea with this character then is that she is immortal, she is invisible, she is a rich adventurer who is always seeking new adventures, and she is world famous for all of these things. So as I'm going into the sketch here, you see I'm doing a few 
layers of it. We're starting by getting the general body type down, then starting to overlay some of the costuming. You can see that we've got a loose rough of her face. By the way, that would not be her face. It's like a mannequin face that I'm just putting in there. I have an idea of what she would look like, but for another time. Um, and that's so that I can also place the goggles and the lipstick and all of that stuff uh, properly. Now, I wouldn't say that this character is all about looks but she has an aspect of presentation because of the era that she grew up in and everything that she feels like that is important um also by putting on the lipstick and putting on the goggles she can draw people's attention to where she wants them to face to look at her when she's talking because otherwise you would never exactly know which direction she was looking in she's got the beauty mark there though because again you know you got to be presentable right now you'll notice in the rough sketch there that there is a like a ponytail tie. Um, at one point I did that. It's not that I necessarily wanted her to have a ponytail. In fact, in, uh, before you could see that there are like finger waves, um, but I wanted something else there to like flesh out more of like where her head, how her head is positioned and what's where and all that, but it actually was too noisy. You'll see that I flat it and then I just thought that it created too much noise. We had the lips the beauty mark the goggle that was the goggles that's all we needed in order to communicate exactly where she was also um or how she was positioned also something that went by really fast because i'm playing this at normal time lapse speed just because i don't want to belabor the rest of these points um something i originally had her with regular gloves on and then i was like oh obviously fingerless gloves that'll have some really interesting aspects potentially she doesn't have fingernail polish on because it just chips off too easily. So she has some practicality about her as well. I mean, she's a legit adventurer, right? Like if she's going to be like punching Nazis in the face or something like that, she can't have uh, fingernail polish. It'll just chip off. But the... Um, but I did also think about like, you know, I'd kind of rather have the emphasis be on the tips of the fingers instead of the palms of the fingers. But I mean, there aren't really gloves that are just like fingertips. So I thought, okay, let's just go ahead with the gloves the way they are. Let's have the fingerless. That's still interesting. And then the way she actually acts in a scene might give us something really interesting there. This was also the first time that I decided to take the environment and instead of ma just making it like some spooky neon colors, I wanted to actually make it something more like where she, like the environment she would be in. So we take a risk with this piece by having the sort of almost like sand, smoky, wispy stuff coming up. It's like she is like somewhere she's like on her adventure kind of. But of course it's everything in this uh, character series is staged like they are in a photo shoot almost. So with this piece overall, she does diverge greatly from all of the other characters. She has no visible character to speak of. Um, she is mostly earth tones when most of these characters are just like crazy neon colors from top to bottom. And that's why I arrived on doing the neon green so that we could still have something that felt like it was a pop or a punch um, for this character to bring her in line with the others. She is certainly a divergence, but when you see her in a lineup with everybody else, it still works. Um, she's starting to, like, like we've talked about with previous characters, she's starting to push and pull at the membrane that defines this character lineup. Uh, that's kind of the interesting thing is that if you, I mean, think of it as logically and robotically as you can, if you design Mickey Mouse and you want something that goes along with Mickey Mouse, the next character is Mickey Mouse. Like in, a, in an exact, okay, I need something that matches this character, the perfect match is another Mickey Mouse, but you can't do another Mickey Mouse, so you do Minnie Mouse, and it sort of pulls it a little bit. That's not the order, by the way, in which those characters were designed, I'm just saying. So then you do Minnie Mouse, and Minnie Mouse is a minor divergence, and then you do Pete, and Pete is a really big divergence, and then you do like goofy or whatever and you start expanding that shit out and as you keep taking these little steps here or there that's pushing that ip out of its comfort zone you're actually opening it a lot of people think that you're like breaking it but you're actually opening it to include more things now obviously if you had some insanely precise thing that you were trying to lock down you would want to try and stick to whatever rules it is that you've defined. But more often than not, if you can expand your IP to include more things, it sets your IP up to sort of like last longer, grow better, include more things, include things that more people are interested in, that type of thing. 
Who's to say that this world can't have a robot in it? Who's to say that this world can't have, I don't know, a demon in it? There's actually a demon coming soon. Um, and those are the types of things that you can only start doing if you've started approaching that type of stuff with your lineup. So where we're at in the phase right now, we're doing all of the uh, form, shadow, ambient occlusion type stuff. Uh, and then we'll go into the direct lighting cast shadows and et cetera, et cetera. Um, if this is your first time on the channel and you want to know more in depth about that process, I recommend going to one of the earlier monster characters where I go more in depth on the actual process and less on the sort of theory of the character design. Okay, we're gonna go into turbo mode now while I just kind of talk more about the character and how she sits in the world. She actually has a lot of friends all over the world because of her adventures. One of those friends will be popping up actually soon. I've already designed that character. That character will come soon. Um, where she fits in with the other characters is, as I mentioned before, she's kind of famous. She's kind of like this hero that's been around forever who's off in adventures but she's not a hero like a superman she's a hero like a real person and like a lot of this archetype that we've seen before where they are mostly heroic but occasionally do things that just serves themselves or serves others like for instance maybe keeping one of the artifacts instead of donating it like that type of thing um she has to grow her her empire somehow. Empire is a, has a negative connotation, but really, again, think more Scrooge McDuck and less, I guess, just Superman if we really want to come get down to it kind of thing. So this character is not part of the sort of main story. She's more of a character that gets inserted in and then exits out. Uh, so that's that's why even though she is also stretching the IP a little bit, she's not the visual that you would have in like the trailer for the product. You would have something that fits much more in line with say like Zola or Larry or Hazel, someone who is more of that, that neon kind of crazier color palette that would represent a more intense designed world as opposed to a char character like this who if you kind of put just your thumb over her like scarf and goggles she basically is a classic adventurer and that's it um so anyways that's that's sort of where she fits in there so the whole effort with all of these not every one of these characters is pulling directly from an existing monster but i try to kind of lightly reference them and uh, and some of the other characters i've actually just tried to do like a straight combo where i'm just like okay this plus this um and other characters are like her where it's more like okay i'm just gonna take that base thing but is there something more interesting that we can do uh with the character obviously not more interesting Interesting than the original because the original was super interesting in its time but something more interesting for now there would maybe be more of a story that we can tell other than someone who ended up being invisible so here at the end we're throwing in the rim light which is usually the last or next to last step after we get that back room light in we're gonna get the glow rim light coming from below and then that will wrap up the character Here's Maxine Drysdale in all of her glory. When I was thinking about this character, I was thinking a lot about Melissa McCarthy in that SNL bit where she's doing that like, why don't you come upstairs and see me up there sometime? And I just couldn't get that out of my head. So this character definitely talks like that, although not as clumsy. She's definitely more of someone who's on top of shit. But um, she's a tough broad who has grown um, a business and a big sort of like adventuring thing around her. And uh, she also just happens to be invisible and ageless and immortal. So let's go ahead and take a look at the major steps real quick and then we will wrap this up. Here's the sketch phase which was done in more time than usual, just because there were some more intricacies to figure out with her. Here are the flats. Here's a bunch of the shadows with some of the lighting thrown on, just a little bit of it. And then here is all of the final effects and all of the lighting. And just as a quick bonus, of course, here is the black and white version, which it's funny when you pull it to black and white, it actually, she feels really retro. She feels very sci-fi, which is cool. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting like and subscribe if you do not already do so. And I will see you on the next video. And if you're looking for me in other places on the internet, this is where you can find me.